Today we're talking about my wife walks all over me. I'm a nice guy. Welcome to the C Note Show, gentlemen, with myself and Cynthia Cruz. She and I have combined over 50,000 hours in this field of coaching and teaching on relationships, sexual dynamics, and polarity, how to reset masculine and feminine polarity within long-term relationship. And that's what we're here to do. And so, Cynthia, when a man feels like he's walked all over, the, the response that he feels in his body, I want to ask how that comes across to a woman. And I pulled an excerpt from No More Mr. Nice Guy by Robert Glover. Five decades of dramatic social change and monumental shifts in the traditional family have created a breed of men who have been conditioned to seek the approval of others. These men are called nice guys, he says. Nice guys are concerned about looking good and doing it right. They are the happiest when they are making others happy. Nice guys avoid conflict like the plague and will go to great lengths to avoid upsetting anyone. In general, nice guys are peaceful and generous. Nice guys are especially concerned about pleasing women and being different from other men. Mm -hmm. they, they wear it as a badge. I'm different. And they're especially concerned about pleasing women. In a nutshell, nice guys believe that if they are good, giving, and caring, they will in return be happy, loved, and fulfilled. Sound good to be tr too good to be true? It is. So what does it feel like for a woman who is around this man who tries to please her, has this scoreboard going on in his mind, and she feels like, man, she's she's not fulfilled in, in what ways? Talk with us about that, please. Yeah, I, I, that energy of wanting to give to make someone else happy seems so normal like that's a human need we have to be in relationship with each other and what a woman can experience when a man in her life is kind of keeping the scoreboard or doing activities and behaviors just to please her she can have a, a myriad of experiences of that one it can feel lackluster and limp because she feels a lack of polarity there and then it also can really be unsettling to her and make her feel untrusting because the energy of what the masculine container is that holds the space has been flipped upside down and is turned all toward her as if she reflects, you know, his well-being, his goodness, whether or not he's achieving that. And that is just a uh, something that can make her feel like she's really far beneath water and then will do anything to try to resurface and get free and have some oxygen from that experience. Yeah. So all of a sudden his well-being is her responsibility and she feels, she feels trapped by that. Yeah. yeah and whether if she feels that it's her responsibility, she can feel trapped or she might pick up on maybe there's resentment on the other side because she's not pulling her end of the bargain of reassuring her man that he's doing a good job. And so she'll take in that resentment as a critique and judgment of her. And that also can kind of bring out a fire breathing dragon of the feminine, either wanting to squash that or will collapse in that or do something to shake up uh, that experience. Yeah, thank you. Well said. So what man here can relate to this? And in particular, we're going to talk about boundaries today. So I want you to post into the chat or certainly raise your hand in the reactions button here in Zoom and, and come in and ask us, question, ask us a question. But in the chat, I want you to put in right now, from a scale of one to 10, how good do you believe you are at setting boundaries with a woman in your life, whether it be uh, your spouse right now, or how might you imagine good, how good you are at setting boundaries, one to 10. And why do you believe that is? If you give yourself a 10, why do you give yourself a 10? If you give yourself a three, why do you give yourself a three? So everyone able to, unless you're driving or you're at work and just can't type into the chat, punch into the chat, one to 10, how good do you believe you are at setting boundaries? And why do you think that is? And we'll step forward here. I have a couple of posts from the forum we'll get into. We're also going to get into the Get Love Back framework around this, around boundaries. And we can't have boundaries unless we have masculine frame. We can't have boundaries unless we break codependence. We know how to reset polarity and grow a powerful self-worth within ourselves. And building healthy boundaries 
within Cynthia and my get love back framework here is around emotional safety, emotional safety for our own selves and emotional safety, emotional safety within the relationship. In order to build healthy boundaries, though, you have to have masculine frame, breaking codependence, resetting polarity, and growing a powerful self-worth. So a boundary setting, again, from No More Mr. Nice Guy, he says, in time, nice guys also learn that boundary setting isn't about getting other people to be different. It's about getting themselves to be different. If someone crosses their boundary, it isn't the other person's problem. It's theirs. Because of memory fear, nice guys often unconsciously reinforce the very behaviors they find intolerable. Due to their childhood conditioning, he says, they teach the people around them that they will accept having their boundaries violated. As recovering nice guys begin to take responsibility for how they let people treat them, their own behavior begins to change. As they stop reinforcing things that aren't willing, they aren't willing to tolerate, the people around them are given the opportunity to behave differently. This gives relationships a chance to survive and grow. Yeah, looking at the chat, was a two, now a seven. Rob, are you able to come in? Tell us about was a two and now a seven regarding boundaries, please. So I would say uh, throughout my marriage, um, I really had no clue about boundaries and how, how to establish them and just kind of had, had no training. Um, and then, of course, uh, what, seven, eight years ago when I um, got with Steve Horseman, um, you know, I started to get a clue. <laughs> so... Um, you know, and, and really the whole nice guy thing, there was a little bit of the codependence, um, needing, um, not necessarily doing to get, um, but more so, um, the criticism and, and the personal attacks and stuff like that were reinforcing the fact that I was needing acceptance from her. So there was definitely a lack of boundaries there and a lack of, uh, and a lot of codependence, I would say. Um, but getting educated on it helped a ton, um, didn't necessarily change her, but it definitely changed me. What was the turning? I, yeah. What was the turning point for you there? Was it a realization or did something happen? What was the turning point for you that you recall? Um, it was just understanding that the challenges, struggles we had were, um, were partly due to the fact that. You know, we, we, we even used to joke about it when we'd have a fight. Why, why, what did, why did we fight about that stupid thing? Mm. You know, and it's like, well, I didn't want you to think bad about me and, and vice versa. I didn't, she didn't want me to think bad about her. And we, we, I don't know how many times we said that and it never really clicked, you know? And then I counseling and, and working with Steve just helped me to realize what that really was. Yeah. Well, that's, it's strange that to say that we don't want to feel bad about, about each other actually doesn't help polarity. It doesn't help us to keep attraction in the relationship that it's okay for her to feel bad about you for a time. Now, how do you make, how do you make sense of that now, Robin? If I say that it's okay for her to not feel good about you for a while. Yeah. So, you know, there's times even recently where she'd be upset with me and I'm okay with that now. Um, it, it doesn't bother me. I, I acknowledge that as her uh, just being emotional. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, yeah. Yeah. It's, and it is quite, it is simple to say, but it's hard in the moment when as, and I I'll say a recovering nice guy, right. Learning these same things too, that we want to please everyone. We don't want to be upset with her, but to, to buck that takes practice, it takes this like this fire or upset in my stomach, like my stomach starts to turn over and my head gets flush and I have to practice not fixing it. Do you have anything like that, Rob? Do you have any kind of physical responses like that? And maybe not anymore. Um, well, so the triggers, right? We talked about triggers. Um, they lightened up, let's say. <laughs> um, they're not as they're not as powerful as they used to be, but uh definitely identifying them and and saying, oh. I, I know what that is now. I can manage through it. And just practicing the managing through it has caused the triggers to lighten up to, you know, even like a week or so ago, it was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you can be mad. That's fine. Yeah. So very, very cool. So what do you feel coming off of Rob now, the way he talks about that, even the way you just smiled that she's upset? Yeah. I, 
It's, it's so interesting, this dynamic of, yes, she can be mad and that's okay because, you know, in the feminine perspective, she might get really worked up about that and dramatic and, oh, I'm mad and this doesn't feel good. And yet when your woman, Rob, gets to feel you as this very warm, stoic, solid presence, I could just feel how you allow kind of the waters of who she is to, to wash by and around you. And that feels so trustworthy and powerful and strong because that you, you don't move and you're not swayed by that. And in that comes an acceptance of, yeah, this is who she is. And this is who she is in the moment. Rob, just taking that in. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for getting us started, Rob. I'm nodding slowly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Fantastic, man. Thanks for getting us started. I appreciate appreciate the change. That's why I asked for you to start. Was a two, now a seven? You know, what does it take? What does it take for me to be a man like Rob? Guys are asking themselves. Thank you for starting us off. Yeah, Jeff, you said three, I'm unsuccessfully navigating a secret credit card issue. Now talk with us about that, please. Thank you. Uh, actually, I can talk. The kids aren't home from school yet, and she went to the office today. So nice. yeah, um, this is right now. She, we got married right out of college. We had nothing. We built it all together. We've only got joint accounts. We each maybe have a credit card, but they all get fed from the same accounts and all this. And I'm responsible for making the bills get paid every month on time. I, you know, that's just my, I'm accountable for it. And all of a sudden the password on one of her cards changed like almost a year ago. And I've been asking about it like a nice guy. And Finally, uh, she keeps telling me, oh yeah, there's about a $1,500 balance on it. And right now we're in some credit card trouble and I'm, I'm doing the Dave Ramsey stuff. I'm trying desperately to dig us out of it. And I don't feel I have a partner about it, but this, this one credit card with the, the secret password that suddenly changed. And <clears throat> every time I ask, it comes up with, a, the response is, Oh yeah, it's about $1,500. I pay a couple hundred dollars every month, but that response has been steady for six to 12 months. So that means there's still charges going on it. And I, I feel that our nest egg is in jeopardy because of this card. And finally Sunday, two days ago, yesterday, whenever that was, I, I, I got the fire and I said, you know, I'm, I don't understand why this is a secret. I don't understand why the password was changed and I'm not okay with it. Good and for you. Yeah. No, she responded with, well, I don't want to fight about money. And I put my tail between my legs and went, oh, okay. And I'm losing sleep. Uh, I'm, I'm to the point of, do we do the divorce math and stay married, but just completely have separate accounts? Um, I, I'm, I'm at a loss. Do I, you know, if I give it a go again, quite frankly, we had, we got in marital trouble because I was a controlling prick and didn't know it. So now is she feeling that control and the pressure and all that? And I don't want to put pressure on and I don't want to monitor her spending. We both make decent salaries. She can be a big girl and own hers. And she has a really tough masculine shell. She's at the office today conquering the financial world. Great. So I'm, I'm battling between putting my foot down with control. And quite frankly, she, we don't fight much. The last time we did, she had bottled it up for a couple of years and said, yeah, she dropped the bomb. So I've joined these groups and really gotten a lot better about me. And I was codependent, never even knew that was a thing, totally. But now I, I'm battling this control versus trust issue and I'm stuck. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. We can tell this matters deeply to you and it, right? And losing sleep and it's causing anxiety. So if there's a spectrum and on one end of the spectrum is controlling, like controlling asshole. And on the other end of the spectrum is, uh, I just stick my head in the sand. Like there's a space in between when you're not a controlling asshole, but you're no longer sticking your head in the sand either. Like there is a space there. It doesn't, there's, it's not just one to the other, right? There's a big space of what you care about, your values, wanting to bring that in the world. So let me ask, uh, she doesn't want to fight about money. Would it have to be a fight? Just be honest with us. Would it have to be a fight? Would you like lose your shit in the moment and make it a fight? No. In fact, I. I said, I don't understand why this has to be a fight. I just don't understand why this is secret. And she hummed and hawed and I backed up. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about this and whatever we say here, you're going to make your own choice and we're never here to yep. pressure you right with anything like that, but you don't have to understand 
and she doesn't have to understand. It's just, you're not okay with having secret credit cards, period. Yeah. Because you're in financial bed together. That's why. So yeah. there doesn't need to be a talking someone into it or making her understand. It's just, I'm not okay with secret credit cards. And I, yeah, I feel I tried that. And then uh, Steve has some videos about it. I, I feel I, uh, I, I made the stand and instead of getting the re response I wanted of, oh yeah, the, the password is whatever. It was a pushback and I fell apart. Right. Because the, I'm making a stand, like puffing my chest kind of thing is just posturing bullshit, right? Like you're, yep. that's not, that doesn't mean anything. And she called your bluff basically. So what, what does this mean to you? It obviously is incredibly important to you. I've said before on air, if you haven't heard this, that I think secret money spent is a financial betrayal in relationship to me. That's my opinion. And so what does that mean if there's a betrayal in relationship? And it doesn't have to be one to 100. You don't go one to a thousand and, you know, just jumping, jumping all those steps of consequence. But what is the consequence? What do you think the consequence would eventually be? Or what's the progression of consequence for financial betrayal potentially? Well, that's just it. If I make a real stand, <clears throat> quite frankly, I feel there is the, the, the risk of that's it. We can't make it work. We're done. It could go that extreme. Sure. So here's the real question. If you really think this is a threat, a safety threat to your financial well-being, then it, it's a safety issue and you would do re reasonably in, calib in a calibrated way, in an adult way, right? In a masculine, deep, kingly way, you would take, you would take progressive steps toward whatever you need to do to make that threat no longer exists. Like if your child was running into the street and there's a safety threat, I don't care if the child intellectually understands that that's a bad idea. I'm grabbing their arm and yanking them out of the street and then we'll deal with it basically after that. But if this is truly a betrayal, I think the nice guy question is, am I okay if I leave this relationship? Because if you play this all the way out, that's what you're just saying. If you play this all the way out, and this feels like a betrayal and it's not okay with you in relationship. And she says, well, tough cookies, pound sand. I don't care what you think. Then ultimately, what are you willing and able to do? Yeah, the best, best idea I've got right now actually came from Steve Harvey of every month from the joint account, feed yourself some money. And she does what she does with that account. And that's the one that links to her secret credit card. And she goes and lives her life and I live my life. And if they're on the same path for now, that's fine. Well, that's interesting. We've talked about a, a structure kind of similar, but the secret credit card thing, you're still liable for. Yep. I mean, the, the whole secret financial thing, like if you went and blew five grand, 10 grand, a hundred grand, she probably wouldn't be happy about that. She'd feel financially betrayed, right? Yeah. So ultimately, would you walk away from a relationship due to a betrayal is really the question. You know, I, I, I don't see this as, a, I, I'm, I'm channeling John Gray. Don't sweat the small stuff. Is $1,500 going to break us forever? No. So I don't know. And that's, I guess, where I'm falling apart. Yeah, good. So let me reel it back in. It's like, do you trust her? You're kind of saying no. I do. She's actually proven her trust over the last couple of years through this problem, through the, our problems. She's proven herself to be true to her word. Okay. And she's also liable for the debt as well. It's not like the debt's just on you. It's on both of you. So if she's trustable and you ultimately just what you've said a moment ago, you'd probably be willing to just let her have her secret credit card. If that's what you're saying. If you're not willing to ultimately don't and don't go, don't go run out and end your relationship after we hang up the phone here. Right. Yeah. But if ultimately a hundred steps down the road, you weren't willing to end the relationship, then it isn't a deal breaker for you. And it really cannot be a boundary if there's no consequence. And right. so then we're back to you. So within you, and Patrick, thanks for raising your hand. Give us just a moment. So back to within you, what is it about the anxiety and the feeling like your nest egg is at risk? What is it about something within you? I, I'm unable to provide for us and protect us with this unknown variable. So is that true? Yes. Okay, why is that true? What about it's true? Our, our entire financial well-being has, it's like I've got all of these arteries and somebody slit one and it could be bleeding out or it could heal or it could whatever, but I'm not allowed to see it. So you don't trust her. Mm -mm. Yeah, but I do. Okay. So this is the gap. This is where yeah. we are. 
Yeah. Is there other ways that you maybe don't trust her that this is leaking over or you're projecting onto the financial situation? Yeah. What What's that way? Oh, um, well, we went through a year of limbo land. She made a very brave move to consciously decide to give me another chance, come back together. And shortly thereafter, she started going through significant surgeries and the, uh, the, the physical intimacy has been just shot to shit and almost nothing for two years making the total time three years okay and what about that means you don't trust her uh well the the you know the ongoing issue the ongoing anxiety for that is uh <clears throat> it, it's it's an all or none complete all or none what is and physical in, intimacy to the point of even just a hug a kiss it, it's all or none if if there's any physical pain it's completely off limits oh okay and there's a, there's going to be a question here for cynthia in a second so within you what is it about that that makes you not trust her i uh, um you know we i i did the the got rejected pout pouted bitched we had obligation sex and i, I get it now that was for years hmm. and that's not what i want but there's there's got to be some middle ground where we can you know connect physically and anytime that comes up, I get the same kind of reaction. I'm in pain. I don't want to fight about it. Okay. And I'll ask Cynthia here in a second. For you, if she's not connecting with you physically, what happens? Like what goes on for you? I, I just drift off. I, I lose the connection. I'm trying desperately to maintain it. And quite frankly, I feel alone. Mm. Yeah. So Cynthia, what is it like for a woman, would you guess, where this physical pain and she doesn't want to touch? And also in the past, she's done obligation sex, which was probably painful, right? Yeah. So it's probably painful and she's in this spot now. What's what's your thoughts on her perspective? And then I want to go back to trusting. Yeah. Oh, Jeff, I'm so sorry that she deals with that and the two of you deal with that. Um, it feels like with her and I see the feminine do this a lot the kind of all or or nothing experience is that let's say she is in pain and she's so overwhelmed because that's her whole reality that when the invitation is to be physical she goes to the other end of the spectrum and assumes that well if I just open a little or relax a little about around this the car is going to zoom ahead and go towards something where I can't pause it and there's like no middle ground so her learning that middle ground is trust trustworthy and safe that she can experience even the the smallest touch but also still have a voice to say oh beyond that that is that's too tough uh could be really helpful but it does sound like she she lives in black and white and that's probably contributing to the intensity of pain when she feels it in the moment when and part of her personality as this kick-ass woman in the world she's in masculine energy a lot which is black and white you know checking the boxes as well um so we could certainly keep talking about this, obviously, Jeff, right? There's, there's a couple of pieces that I want to ask you as homework. And if you would to, to post about this in the forum or bring this back to us, if, if you wrote about this and posted it in the forum, I think it'd be super helpful for you. So one is there's physical connection, emotional connection, spiritual, emotional, mental, con these other ways of connection. And so if you sometimes guys like rating one to 10, which is what I do often, and then why you gave yourself that number. So if you did all of the different ways, physical, emotional, spiritual. And what is your connection like with her in relationship in all these ways? Physical's a, a one or two from what you're talking about. And the others, I don't know what they would be. So how are you connecting with her in these other ways? That would be one thing to me. Because if it's our relationship is just based on physical and then that goes away, wow, we're feeling really empty and there's not there's no connection there. Yeah. The other is back to the fear of financial ruin. And I call this walking through hell. You may have heard me say this before, but the short version is if that happened, if financial ruin, like the worst financial ruin you can imagine happened, then what would you do next? And I want you to ask yourself that question five times. So financial ruin happens. That's let's say ground zero. What would I do next? What would I do then next? What would I do then next? And ask yourself that question five times and write out a 
at least a few sentences each phase. So it's really five phases after ground zero of what would I do next? A huge piece of our anxiety, same with if there was a betrayal in the relationship and I decided to ultimately end the relationship and that was ground zero, what would I do next? What would I do next? That's walking through hell. Our anxiety is really, we feel like we're going to die, like a tiger is going to jump out of the bushes and kill us. And so if financial ruin happens, that feels like death because our mind just fast forwards to death. That's our, our ego is trying to protect us from dying. So we just fast forward to death. But really, there's so much space there. I don't know if any of you have ever lost a relationship or lost a job or your child did something that you never thought that they would do. And it feels like the end of the world. But then the next day you do what you have to do. And the next day after that, you do what you the best choice you can. You do what you have to do. But when we're imagining a fear, our mind just races all the way to death. So let's play that out. Okay, so one, what are the ways we connect other than physical? And two, if that happened, if ground zero happened, what would I do then thereafter? Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll take from there. Thanks, Jeff. That was really good. Yeah, Patrick, thanks for being super patient. Come on in, please. Um, Beth, Beth, Lee, I just find it interesting. She's in finance and she's in a masculine. So I would go and she understands finance. I, I would approach it from a practical sense without complete information i cannot make the correct decisions as you would know from your work there so i cannot trust that um, i can maintain the financial security that we need it is a boundary for me this lack of trust and just leave it at that and let it hang it's not being controlling and it's framing it in terms of her work because you go back well if you don't get the right financial information from your subordinates or whoever you're trying to make the calculations for dear you won't make a good financial decision in, 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 your, in your career. So Patrick, so you let's make this hard. Let's make this hard. She goes, what, you don't trust that I'm good at finances? I don't need to tell you. I can handle this. Then what? Well, you say, that's a view, dear. It's not my view and it's not my boundary. And she says, well, my view is otherwise, so I'm going to keep it secret. Yep. And you say, yep, that's fine. Keep it secret. But, you're cl but I'm, I, are you clear on my expectations i'm chris i'm crystal clear and i'm not going to do that i'm going to keep it secret you understand anyway. you understand the concept of consequences from behind well, are you threatening me are you threatening me now what are you going to do uh no that, that is not a threat that is um the practicalities as you would know from your um professional career dear that um the ultimately an unpaid debt will have a consequence so I'm, I'm still making this hard, Patrick, right? This is with love. Cool. Um, are cool. you mansplaining to me finance? It sounds like mansplaining. You don't think I understand this? Of course, debt. I told you I'm being responsible with it. I told you, but I don't want to fight about money. And now you're starting a fight about money. Look at you again, starting a fight about money. On what premise did you reach that conclusion, dear? Now you're being a controlling ass. So uh, this, the whole point here is you're not going to win this logical, let's try to talk her into you know, coming to my side, she, it just, well, let me ask, let me ask Cynthia. Thank you, Patrick. Let's, let's pause on the, on the financial controlling argument. <laughs> let's, let's pause on the, on that for a minute. So what does it feel like when Patrick keeps coming at it that way? Well, I, I admire anyone who meets you verbally, <laughs> putting the spear down. Uh, I pretend to be the woman and have an argument with Patrick. Thanks. Yes. Cool. Okay. Uh, yeah. It felt, I mean, if I was kind of just feeling into the energy of that, it felt like every time logic met, met logic, there was less power behind it. And the like feminine in that situation is winning the logic, logic argument. And she also gets to tie in her whole emotional world as well in terms of I feel controlled and you're doing this and the judgment of that. And so it felt like it feels like a no win and where the woman then gets to leave with these stories about, well, you know, I can't trust him to do this, or he doesn't really appreciate how I feel, or her anger, or frankly, wanting to just avoid that in the future, and then kind of taking her emotional world in another direction. Yeah, and, and the, ultimately, you can't force someone to do something. So part, okay. part of my approach, Jeff, in response to you was the she is in a masculine so there's an ability to perhaps argue the logic while she's in the masculine when she gets defensive she'll drop into the feminine 
but you at, at the initial state, or Jeff S at the initial state, while she's in a masculine, use that opening statement that I gave and just leave it. She'll start getting defensive and you just calmly say, I'm stating a boundary. That is my boundary. Your view is your view. But the, the, the trick that I, well, it's not a trick, but the thing being, while she's in a masculine, use the logic. So thank you, Patrick. I'm, I'm going to press pause in you and I'll respond to what you just said. So thank you. Um, I, I think it's a great thing to start with that, which would have been years ago for Jeff, probably at this point. Uh, I'm assuming there's been a lot of logical back and forth for years and going at it in that way, not a bad idea. And I made it hard on purpose because as soon as she says, no, I don't agree with you logically, and no, I'm not going to give you my secret credit card password, then what? And I know I don't agree that as soon as she becomes defensive, she'll get more masculine. That's not what happened or get more feminine. She's, as Cynthia just said, she's going to weave in how you're an asshole controlling all these other stories and still not give you the credit card. So the, the point there I want to make, this ultimately comes to, if I have a boundary, then there has to be a consequence that I'm willing to step forward into. And if I'm not willing to step forward into a consequence, then it's not really a boundary and I'm bullshitting myself and I'm basically just going to what? freak out and collapse in on myself because I can't uphold something that's important to me. And this is back to the nice guy trying to appease other people. And what does the nice guy do when he doesn't get his way? He, he becomes more feminine and emotional and angry and manipulative. And all of that absolutely torpedoes a relationship because it's depolarizing. He's more feminine. And now he is being an angry, whatever asshole trying to control with emotion and manipulation. And that's just going to tank the relationship. So I appreciate the logical, the argument, the logical idea, but she doesn't have to, if that doesn't work, then what? That's really the, that's the point. If that doesn't work, then what? Cynthia, anything else that you wanted to add there? You guys have been phenomenal in the chat. We haven't had a chance to, to keep reading. Um, Rob mentioned, thank you for sharing, but you're just being controlling. Go deeper, please there. Rob, if you ask the question, I'll ask Cynthia that as well. Thank you for sharing, but you're being controlling. Yeah, please. Well, you, you kind of went there eventually. Okay. <laughs> so you, you did cover it, but, um, you know, I, I think what it comes down to is, you know, this whole boundaries and consequences thing at some point, it, it's like, women seem to be in, in this conversation group <laughs> um, wanting to be in control. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's almost like we have to take it to that level of uh, like the chat about the phone, right? The chat about the, everything else that we've been bringing up here, the finances, the whatever else it is, I'm, I'm going out, uh, okay, where are you going? Oh, am I being controlling by asking where you're going? You know, at what point do we get get to where there's a uh, mutual respect in the relationship? And if there isn't mutual respect, are we going to say, okay, here's the list of non-mutual respect things. These are a boundary. The consequences, this relationship ain't working. Mm -hmm. I'll leave it there. Yeah, that's that's a great question. And again, it goes doesn't go from one to 100. And I'd say in every one of these instances, there's been nice guy mistakes, blind spots, boundary issues for years. So we're talking about, you know, the phone on the couch with the kissy faces or these kind of things. It's like not that's not the first thing that ever happened in these areas. And to to sum this up and then I'll go to Cynthia and we'll close out our call for today. It's what am I willing to do? What am I going to do? Cuz I can't force someone else. So I'm not going to stay in a relationship where someone hides financial things from me. Or I'm not going to be in a relationship where someone isn't going to show me their texts on their phone. That if that's my, if that's who I am, if that's my truth, I don't jump for divorce tomorrow. But if that's my truth, I'm not going to stay. I'm not going to be in a relationship with someone who violates the relationship in these ways. Then if that's true, ultimately I will exit the relationship if that's true, one way or the other. And all we can control is the amount of our affection, the amount of our attention and the commitment of the relationship. And that's a conversation for another time. We've taught it on that and we could talk about that. Well, what do I do? What are the 100 steps, Jeff? They have to do with affection, attention, and commitment. And ultimately the commitment is the final one step 100 out of 100. Yeah. 
So what are your thoughts on this as far as maybe this has been building and this woman said, no, I'm not showing you my phone, the kissy face is on my phone. What might you add into what Rob is saying about her wanting to feel in control of her own self? And this has been building for years, most likely. Yeah, it makes me feel into just the the humanness of this. And if if I observe the masculine finding boundaries versus control over, I witness women dealing with their own fear of loss, their own self-shame of of self-abandonment, of unsettledness in in who they are and, and what they get to experience in relationship through trying to control things. So I know that doesn't give a wonderful answer to like, what did we do with the phone on the couch? But that this is not really a woman trying to set out and control the relationship. This is her own bomb to calm her anxiety. And that comes from a very authentic place, but that also doesn't mean that you don't get to have boundaries with that. And sometimes the anxiety a woman feels in relationship can find solidity and trust when there is a boundary she can feel solidly. Even if there's tantrums along the way, a woman's anxiety most often comes from her own sense of container for herself and or a container that someone holds for her. Yeah, very well said. And guys, so don't run out and have a fight like I did with Patrick. Just love you. I love you, Patrick. Thanks for playing with me. Don't run out and have a fight. Don't go out and like try to be big dick and have a boundary after this process. Post on the forum and ask yourself if you had all three of these pieces fully masculine frame, emotional safety in the relationship, and you're able to lead within intimacy. Would you even give a shit about the kissy faces on her phone? Like, would you just know that you're awesome? And that you know how to cultivate a fantastic relationship. And if she violates it, that you wouldn't stay. Like if you really knew all those things about yourself, would you even, would this even be an issue? And as we were exploring here, it's usually an offshoot of something else, or we felt like we violated our own boundaries for years. And I've been there. Like when I was in your spot and I first found this work, I was there. I had unknowingly been violating, you know, my own integrity and my own boundary for years And so I was to the point where I was either explode in anger or collapse because I didn't know how to do this in a healthy way, in a kingly way. So appreciate you guys being here. Cynthia, thank you so much. We'll see you guys next week. Same time. Honor for being here. Jeff, thank you so much. Rob, I appreciate it. Patrick, you're awesome.